Church family, we are so excited that you chose to join us today for our sermon. We can't wait for you to hear this message that will hopefully enlighten, challenge, and push you to grow in your relationship with God. Here at Hub Church, we help people know God, discover their purpose, experience freedom, and make a difference through having a passion for the Holy Spirit, and we can't wait for you to join us on this journey. If you haven't already, be sure to hit the subscribe button and make sure you hit the notification bell so you know when we post all of our videos. We love you and we can't wait to see you in person. Enjoy the sermon. We've been in a, a, a series called Navigating the Storms of Life, or no, no Navigating the Changes of Life, uh, the Seasons of Change. And today, uh, today's sermon title is Weathering the Storms of Change. And, uh, you know, the, the very definition of a storm is a violent disturbance. When you think of it that way, it gives you a little different perspective of the why seasons of change can challenge us, right? A violent disturbance. How many of you want a violent disturbance? No, none of us do, but how many of us get violent disturbances? Absolutely, probably all of us do. And, and storms can be very destructive, but they can also contribute to growth, to renewal, and to resilience. Trees are a, a real common symbol of resilience. When faced with, with strong winds or storms, trees may bend and sway, but they remain rooted and, and, and steadfast. And like trees, we can... Uh, weather the storms of life. We can go through the winds and, the, and the, the things that are blowing against our lives and bend, but not necessarily break. You know, the, when our roots are established in God and being obedient to Him, then we have a, a, a firm foundation. I, I've heard this, this analogy many times regarding the formation of diamonds. You know, diamonds are formed under immense pressure and heat deep within the earth. And the process of intense transformation results in the creation of something beautiful and something valuable. And it's, it's similarly, the, the pressures and challenges we face in life can refine our character and can establish strengths in our lives. It, and it really has the ability to shape us into something beautiful. And God truly does want to make us into something beautiful. Rain descends and comes down and is essential for nourishing the earth and supporting growth. While storms may bring temporary disruptions and upheaval, they also provide the necessary conditions for new life to flourish. And, and in the middle of life storms, we can trust that growth and renewal are possible, even in challenging circumstances. Anybody here experiencing any challenging circumstances? Amen? You know? Uh, the forces of erosion, such as wind and, and, and water, gradually shape and sculpt the landscapes over time. And likewise, the challenges that, that, that and difficulties we encounter in life can mold and shape us, shaping our character, our values, and our perspectives in meaningful ways. As I've said in the past, are the challenges of life and the things that we're facing making us bitter, or are they making us better? They have that option. We have that option. Is it, what is it doing? By drawing parallels from nature, we can find inspiration and guidance on how to navigate through life's storms with resilience, with faith, and with hope. Just as nature demonstrates the capacity for growth and the renewal in the face of adversity, we too, we can emerge stronger from the challenges we encounter. And we have to be aware that, that change so often comes because of a violent unexpected disturbance in our life. And it, it brings change, doesn't it? When you go through something that's, that's it's disturbing. Seasons of change bring unexpected challenges and difficulties. And in, in today, I want to look at uh, how to lean on God's strengths and courage to persevere through the storms of life. In, in Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 10, it says this. It says, Fear not, for I am with you. 
Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And then the same verse in the Passion Translation says it this way. It says, do not yield to fear, for I am always near. Never turn your gaze from me, for I am your faithful God. I will infuse you with my strength and help you in every situation. I will uphold you firmly with my victorious right hand. So my first point today is trust in God's promises. You know, in, in the book of Exodus, the Israelites forced, their, you know, they, they, were, they were being in a situation where they were trying to escape slavery in Egypt, and, and, and they were going on a journey to the promised land. Uh, we look at this so many times as something that is, is terrible, the, the, the situation that they were under. But remember that this is the continuation of the story of Joseph and God elevating him to a position of great authority in Egypt. And it was through that elevation that he was able to save his family in Egypt, and from, save them from the drought that would have destroyed the descendants of Jacob. And, and according to Genesis 46 and verse 27, it says there were 70 people from Joseph's family that came to dwell in Egypt, 70 people. When the same family left Egypt, it was estimated at two to three million. They were pretty prolific. Now, man, you, man it, it took 400 years, but God was creating a nation. God was doing something. I say this just to remind us that some seasons are there by design because God is developing something in and through us as we are in that season. But it's also a stepping stone to something much bigger and better for us in the future. Moses brought them out of Egypt, but there were challenges all along the way as they, as they stepped into the new season that God had brought them into. And I can honestly say that there are many times in my own life where I would ask God to get me out of a particular season. God, get me out of this mess. Get me out of this season because I, I felt like, man, if I get out of this, then it's going to be better in the next place. And you get in the next place, and God is still doing something in your life in the next place. And you're going, God, get me out of this mess. And the thing that I realized after a while is that I had to learn to enjoy the journey. There are things that we go through that, that just are difficult. But the sooner that we recognize that God has a plan and that He has a purpose, that, that there is something that he's trying to teach me or show me or develop in me. And, and the sooner that I accept the fact that he's doing something in me for a reason, then I can get through it better and I can start to enjoy the journey. Now, I'm not, I'm not imposing the, that, that it's always a struggle. It isn't always a struggle. I, I will say that. I'm saying that there will always be things that we can look at with disdain or with attitudes of thanks. And we have both opportunities all the time. I've learned, though, to enjoy the journey and to always be developing that, that closeness with God so I don't miss His leading in the season that I'm in. Despite the adversities that... that they encountered, God promised to be with the children of Israel, and He led them through the wilderness. By trusting in God's promises, they were able to weather the storms of change and find strength in His presence. And, and I will say, it, it wasn't that they didn't murmur or complain. They did along the way, but they were able to weather the storms. And I, I want to emphasize the importance, though, of knowing God's Word, the Bible. In order to trust in God's promises, we have to know what they are. And it only comes from us spending time daily 
with the Word of God through prayer support from, from loved ones and a deep trust in God's Word and faithfulness. We can find the strengths to weather the storms. Uh, you know, whether it's a health challenge or a financial challenge or a relationship challenge, and, and we can emerge with a renewed sense of hope and resilience if we are looking for God in the process. So my second point is to lean on God's strength. In Psalm 46 and verse 1, it says, God is our refuge and strength an ever-present help in trouble. Thank you, Lord. And then in Isaiah 40, in verse 31, it says, But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. And I didn't tell her that verse earlier, okay? So, so. <laughs> This verse speaks about putting one's trust and hope in God during challenging times and the promise that God will provide new renewed strength and perseverance to those who rely on Him. When we trust Him and we put our, our trust in Him and in His promises, then we can start to soar above the situations. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes you're in the thick of it and you need to get elevated above it so you can see what really is going on. You need to get God's perspective. You need to get His view of what you're going through. It encourages us to believe, to lean on God's strength and not, not just during difficult seasons, but all the time. He's able to sustain and to give the endurance that's needed to overcome challenges. Someone who leaned on God's strength during a difficult season is the Apostle Paul. If we look in the New Testament, Paul faced numerous trials. And I love the way that it's described. You know, he endured hardships and persecutions in his ministry for the sake of spreading the gospel. He went through literally hell. And, and despite facing imprisonments, beatings and shipwrecks and other challenges, Paul remains steadfast in his faith and trust in God. And, you know, I, I was thinking about it. You know, you think about what Paul went through and, and some of the challenges that he had. You know, not only was he challenged in his physical body, but then, you know, he's going to Rome and the ship crashes. You know, it's in a storm and it gets destroyed and, and he's shipwrecked and he's floating on a board, you know, getting to land. And, and how many of you would maybe question God, why? Why am I going through this storm? And the truth is that God takes us through storms because he's trying to develop us in us something. Then after he gets on land, he gets bit by a viper. You know, talk about having a bad day. <laughs> you know? But the truth is, in all of those things, he was able to look beyond his challenges and trust in God. Uh, you know, I look at the situations that we complain about now at times and realize sometimes we're just plain wimps. Any wimps out there? <laughs> you know, we complain about the, the, some of the stupidest things, and, and I don't think that I've ever been shipwrecked. I don't think that I've ever been bitten by a viper, you know, and, and, I, and I think you know, that we can grow up a little bit in our faith. In 2 Corinthians 12, verses 9 and 10, Paul writes about a thorn in his flesh that he pleaded with God to remove. However, God responded with this, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul then goes on to say, that he will boast all the more gladly of his weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon him. Paul learned to rely on God's strength in his weakness and found that God's grace was enough to sustain him through every trial that he faced. Rather than being discouraged by his, his hardships, Paul found that his weaknesses allowed God's power to shine through and give him the strength he needed to continue in his ministry. Paul's example shows us that when we face difficult seasons, 
We can lean on God's strength and trust in His grace to sustain us. Another example of someone who leaned on God's strength during a difficult season is the prophet Elijah. Now, in, in 1 Kings 19, we see Elijah facing a, a, a time of great discouragement and despair after a confrontation with the prophet of Baal on Mount Carmel. Now, remember the story where Elijah challenges the false prophets of Baal uh, to call upon their God to consume with a fire an offering that they put, a sacrifice that they put on the altar. And, and it never happened, you know. Paul, or, or I'm sorry, Elijah is, is, is talking about and he's challenging them and kind of taunting them. Is your God asleep? What's going on? You know, maybe you need to scream a little loud or maybe you need to wake him up. You know, and, and it never happened. God, though, in Elijah's case, he had had them pour water on the sacrifice. And then he called on God and God came down and he not only consumed the sacrifice, but the water and everything else that was around it. You know, despite experiencing a powerful victory there over the false prophets, Elijah was soon threatened by Queen Jezebel, causing him to flee in fear of his life. Elijah found himself overwhelmed and exhausted, feeling like he could not go on in the situation. And in his distress, he cried out to God, expressing his feelings of hopelessness and weariness, basically saying, I'm the only one. And it wasn't true, but he, he felt that. And if you ever been in that situation, you like you felt like, I'm the only one that's got this kind of stuff going on in my life. Anybody? I know I have. I've been there. Is anybody, you know, have, has anybody experienced what I'm experiencing now, God? I, I, I can't believe that they are, because man, look at the mess I'm in. And the truth is that it really doesn't matter if they are or aren't. It's whether or not I'm looking to God. And, and, and so in verse 4, Elijah says, I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. And, and in response to Elijah's despair, aren't you glad that God doesn't answer every one of your prayers? <laughs> it, it, God provided strength and encouragement in a supernatural way. An angel appeared, and an angel appeared to Elijah, provided food and water, and instructed him to rest and regain his strength. God also spoke to Elijah in a gentle whisper, reassuring him of his presence and guidance. Through this experience, Elijah learned to trust in God's provision and strength, even in the middle of overwhelming challenges. Are we there? Are we in the middle of overwhelming challenges and are we listening for the still small voice? Despite feeling weak and discouraged, he found renewed strength and courage in God's presence and was able to continue on in the ministry. Likewise, that is where we find strength. It is in God's presence. It's when we come into God's presence is where the power of God comes in and has the ability to transform and change us and take us from one place to another to take us through a challenge. Uh, by seeking His presence and trusting in His provision, we can find the courage and endurance we need to persevere through life's challenges. But we, we, we have to seek His presence. By acknowledging our weaknesses and relying on God's power, we can find the strength and the courage to persevere through challenges and experience His presence and peace in the middle of trials. And I think that we, we, we need to realize that when we're in the middle of a trial, sometimes we're trying to figure it out. We're trying to go, God, how, or we're, just, we're just looking for an answer. And the truth really is getting into his presence. I have many times been in the situation where there was challenges in front of me and I didn't know which way to turn. I didn't know which way was up. And I would get into, into God's presence. I would start to cry out and I'd start to worship him and his presence would come in. His manifest presence would come down and I would start to experience God's presence in the room. And it was in those moments that all of a sudden I got peace. I didn't necessarily get an answer to the situation, but His peace came in. And His peace is what we need when we're in the middle of a storm. 
You know, when you're going through a difficult situation, it's not always, I need the answer. I just need peace. I just need some peace. You know, you, 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 you ever been in one of those situations where it's just there's so much turmoil and noise and there's so many voices and so many things going on around you and you just need a little peace. I just need to get alone. Well, you need God's presence and it's in His presence that we can truly find the peace. And many times it's when we get into that place of acknowledging and experiencing His peace that we start to get really the answers that we need. God really, by acknowledging our weaknesses and relying on God's power, we can find the strength and the courage that we need to go through what we're going through. His presence and the peace that comes in the middle of chaos sometimes. Jesus' disciples faced a storm while crossing the Sea of Galilee, and in their fear and desperation, they turned to Jesus, who calmed the storm and showed them his power over nature. There's a, there's a key, though, in this, and I, I think that we need to become aware of this, and that is there was a desperation. In their heart, there was a desperation for God, for an answer. They're in the middle of the storm, and they needed an answer. They needed something, and they cried out in desperation for God. And, and I think that we as a people, as Christians, we need to have a desperation for the things of God. We need to have a hunger and a thirsting for God's presence. There is those moments in life when you, you think you've got it all together, and then in a second, a storm comes in and just knocks you away, knocks you down a little bit. And the truth is, when we have His presence, and when we grab hold of the hand of God, that it's in those storms and in that, 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 that desperate cry, that desperation, God, help! You know, sometimes that's the only thing that you can cry out. Help! Anybody been there? I remember very clearly when my wife had our second child, um, and she had a, a, a very bad situation happen in her physical body. And at one point, you know, she couldn't even sit in a room where there was light. You know, the, 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 the light just, just, just bothered her so much. She had massive headaches, and, and she was just in pain all the time. And honestly, there were moments the only thing I would pray and I'd pray and I'd pray, but the only thing that she could do would just cry out, help God, help. See, when we get desperate and we, we truly seek His face, He will be found. We can find Him in those desperate moments. There's a, there's a, a real big thing that shaped the disciples, and that was that they were desperate for God. It's so often when we get desperate that we truly press into finding God. And, and that's when we develop the courage that we need to weather the storms. Today there are many challenges and difficult situ situations that we may lean on God's strength for. Things like health issues, dealing with physical or mental health challenges can be overwhelming, and we may need God's strength to help us through the healing process and to provide comfort and peace. Might be financial difficulties, you know, such as debt or unemployment or unexpected expenses, you know, can be stressful, and we may need God's guidance and provision to help us navigate those challenges. Uh, it could be difficulties in relationships with family members, and nobody here in this church has ever had that. That's the church down the street. But, but you, know, you know, you may have a problem with your spouse, or you may have an issue with another family member, and it's emotionally draining, and we may need God's wisdom and grace to help us communicate effectively and to resolve difficulties. You know, it might be coping with the loss of a loved one, uh, or going through a period of grief, and it can be heartbreaking, and we may need God's comfort and assurance to help us find healing and hope. Sometimes just the pressures of life alone 
maybe you've got a difficult boss or, or, or you know, you're, there's so much uncertainty in your life and it's overwhelming. And, and we, we just need God's guidance and strength to nav navigate the challenges and, and make wise decisions in times even of natural disasters, you know, social unrest or political turmoil. We may feel anxious and uncertain about the future. And we may need God's peace and assurance to help us trust in his sovereign plan. You know, there's things going on in this country that can be very disturbing, isn't there? But you know what? When we find our hope and our faith in Jesus Christ, you know, things can be happening all around us, but we know that God's got a plan and that God's got a purpose and we trust in him. And he says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor their seed out begging for bread. God knows where you're at. He knows every situation you're, you're in, and He knows everything that you're encountering, whether you're encountering it in your family or in this land. God has things that are going on. Maybe you're facing doubts or questions, of, or maybe you're just in a spiritually dry place in your faith journey, and, and it can be disheartening, and we may need God's presence when we are in a dry place, it says, you know, I remember this, and I, I, re I remember one time I just was in this dry place, and, and I, I, I never stopped going to church. Even when I was in the dry place, I knew I needed to be in God's presence, but it was just dry. And, and I remember just feeling sorry for myself because I felt so dry. And, and, and even as I had the thought in my head the preacher that was preaching said, you know, it's not God's responsibility to break up your fallow ground. It's your responsibility to break up that dryness in you so the moisture can get in. And it was such a conviction to me that I needed to break up some hard things in my heart. I had established some emotional things that were holding me back, and I needed to break them up so that the moisture of God's presence could come in. And sometimes it's just that. Sometimes we need God to, to, to rain His presence down, but we also, in those seasons of dryness, we need to say, God, I'm sorry, help me. You know, help me to break up this, this fallow ground, you know? It, in all of these situations, more uh, and more, you know, we need to lean on God's strength. We need to pray. You know, I, I know that prayer makes a difference. It really does. When we pray and we cry out to God, it makes a difference. When we're meditating on His Word and we, we worship God, not just here when we're together, but when you're in your own private times. Do you worship God? Do you take time to, to uh, worship the King of Kings? And, and worship Him with your whole heart? Do you get desperate enough that you actually break out of that shell that says, oh, I don't sing. I don't, I don't do that. And you do it. I guarantee you, when you start to step out and do those things that the enemy has convinced you that, oh, that's not me, I just don't do those things. When you do them, God will start to move into your situation seeking support from others and trying to get help in those times will make a difference. Trusting in His promises can help us find the courage, the resilience and peace we need to face life's challenges and hope and confidence. We need that. My, my, my third point is find courage in God's presence. In Joshua 1.9 it says, Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. When Joshua succeeded Moses as the leader of the Israelites, he faced the daunting task of leading the children of Israel into the promised land. And I would not have wanted to step into Moses' shoes I mean, think about all the miracles that occurred under the leadership of Moses. I, I don't know about you, but I certainly would have had some fears in stepping into that role as Joshua. I thought about what some of them could have been, and, and here's what I came up with, and also realized that these are things that we encounter today as well. 
One of the things that I thought about that probably might have been one of the things that Joshua thought about was inadequacy. Joshua may have feared that he was not qualified or experienced enough to lead the Israelites after the great leadership of Moses. He may have doubted his abilities to fulfill such a significant role. I mean, think about it. Moses led them through the Red Sea. It wasn't like he just took them across the street. They went through the the Red Sea. You know, come on. Where's your faith? Okay, let me strike this water and see it part. No pressure, man. You're following in that guy's footsteps, you know? know, Uncertainty may have been another thing. Leading a large group of people through a wilderness and into a a new and and, and possessed land may have challenged him. You know, he may have felt very uncertain. Joshua may have been anxious about how to navigate these obstacles and the uncertainties that were there. Maybe uh, he had this thought of about maybe the inability to lead. The Israelites were about to enter the land of Canaan, which is inhabited by numerous powerful nations. And Joshua may have feared the military battles that he was going to have to encounter and, and, and what laid ahead of him. Another thing, responsibility. Taking on the responsibility of leading a whole nation was a heavy burden for Joshua. He may have feared making mistakes or falling in his leadership, failing in his leadership, I should say. Maybe, you know, you're in those type of situations where the responsibility is being dumped on you. Another thing was spiritual leadership. Maybe Joshua understood the importance of leading the Israelites in faithful obedience to God's commands. He may have feared the spiritual challenges of keeping the people focused on God and avoiding idolatry and disobedience. Despite all of these fears, and and each one of those things could be in our own lives, you know? Are you dealing with inadequacy? Do I feel inadequate? Do I feel uncertain? Do I feel like there's an inability to lead? Do I feel like the responsibility is too much for me? Or do I feel like I am able to be the spiritual leader that I need to be? Despite all those fears, God reassured Joshua with his presence, with his guidance and, and promises. And in Joshua 1.9 God encourages Joshua saying, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Joshua's faith in God's promises and in his presence enabled him to overcome his fears and lead the Israelites with confidence and strength into the promised land. It's you have to recognize that that promise, be strong and courageous. That's the word of the Lord to you today. Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord, your God, will be with you wherever you go. Whatever you may be experiencing, whatever challenges that are in front of you, whatever fears you may be having right now, know this, that God is with you. Don't Be afraid, but be strong and courageous. When you think of of Paul and his encounter with Jesus, you know, Paul was, was really zealous when he was Saul. And on the road to Damascus, it was a perfect example of God's manifest presence, which later brought courage to do amazing things for God. We read about how Saul was, was a, a persecutor of Christians and was on his way to Damascus to continue his mission of, of arresting and persecuting followers of Jesus. And then all of a sudden, a light from heaven flashed around him, and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul fell to the ground and heard Jesus speaking to him, revealing himself as the risen Lord. This powerful encounter with the manifest presence of Jesus completely transformed Saul's life. He was blinded by the light and he had to be led to Damascus where he waited 
for three days without food or sight. I got a feeling in those three days he experienced a deep sense of conviction, a deep sense of God's presence, and, and really a realization of the error of his ways and the truth that Jesus was the Son of God. Through the intervention of Ananias, who was sent by God to restore Saul's sight and baptize him, Saul's eyes were opened both physically and spiritually. I mean, we could, we could sit there and just talk about Ananias, man. That was, that was a step of faith for him to go, to, to, to go and see Saul. But he was, at that point, he was filled with the Holy Spirit and his life was radically changed. The manifest presence of Jesus in that encounter on the road to Damascus brought courage to Saul, transforming him from a persecutor of Christians to one with the greatest, one of the greatest advocates and one of the greatest teachers of the Christian faith. Have you, have you encountered God? Have you encountered his presence like Saul? Have you encountered that manifest presence of God in your life that has the, the power to transform you, to change you, to make you do something that is out of the abilities that you naturally have? Can I step out and do something in faith that I could never do without God being with me? We all have an opportunity to experience and encounter God's presence in a supernatural way. And when we get into that place of an encounter with Jesus Christ, and he starts to do something like a transforming work like he did with Saul and changed his name to Paul, has he changed your name? Is something different in your life now than it was before you knew Jesus? Is there something, is there a power? Is there something that God has called you do, to do that you could never have thought of even doing before you knew Jesus? And even now, knowing him, you realize that you can't do it without his help. But God puts those challenges in front of all of us. If I could do it in my own strength, what do I need God for? I don't need him. So that's why God says, I'm putting this in front of you as a challenge so that you rely on me. You trust in me. You put your hope in me. You lean upon me. You gain, you gain your courage from me. It's not in your own abilities. It's in his abilities through you. We have to realize that God has so much that he wants to do in this world, in Rush, New York, in Honey Eye Falls, in Lima, in Henrietta, in Pittsburgh, in Penfield, in Victor, in Menden. He wants to do great things in these communities and he wants to use you and me. But we have to experience that encounter, that power, that presence of God that will raise us up to the point where we say, yes, God, I'll do what you called me to do, even though it looks impossible, even though it looks like I can't possibly do it. I know that with you, all things are possible. Amen. With you, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It is through the power and the anointing of Jesus Christ that I can rise up and become what he's called me to be and do what he's called me to do. You know what? I couldn't start a church on my own. I couldn't do this without God's help. If you, I can write a book, and I probably will one of the, these days, of all the miracles that have occurred in order for me to even start this church. It is the presence of God that will make the difference in your life. It is the manifest presence of God. It's not just knowing about Him, it's knowing Him. It's knowing His presence. It's knowing His leading. It's knowing His guidance. It's experiencing that power in that, that anointing that happens every, can happen every single day of your life if you'll just trust Him, if you'll reach out to Him and you'll say, God, I need you. Help! We can't do it on our own. We can't. I need God's presence. As we navigate the storms of life, 
the challenges that are in front of us. And I know that many of you are in the middle of some challenging situations. Find his presence. Encounter Jesus Christ. Cry out to him in desperation and say, God, I need you. Help! And he'll meet you where you're at. I want to give you hope today. Jesus is right there in the storm with you. Just as he was in the boat with the disciples, he's right there in the boat with you. We just need to reach out for him. We need to call out to him and say, Jesus, help. And he'll look and he'll say, peace, be still. And the storm will calm down. I know we talked a lot about different things stories in the Bible today and then you may think oh those are nice stories but you know I need something tangible and I'm here to tell you that Jesus is completely tangible it starts with me acknowledging that I need help that I need him I need to have a relationship with God that is more than just knowing about him it's actually knowing his voice each and every day God, what are you saying today? What are you speaking to my heart? Close your eyes with me for just a moment. Just bow your head and close your eyes. And I want you to ask this question as you're sitting there. Holy Spirit, what are you speaking to me? What are you asking of me? What needs to change? Help me hear your voice. God, speak to us. Speak to us, Lord. God, I pray right now that you would start to calm storms right now in people's lives, Lord. Right now, I pray, God, the the storms that are raging in some people's lives, that they would start to calm down right now. I speak to the, the wind and the waves, and I say, in Jesus' name, be still. I speak to those things, oh God, that are trying to rise up and discourage and and take hope away. In the name of Jesus, I speak peace to those situations. And God, I pray right now, Lord, release your power into every household. Let that anointing and that power of God come down. If healing is needed, bring healing. If restoration is needed, bring restoration. Lord, if, if if there is some other miracle that needs to happen, God, let there be a demonstration that you truly do care and manifest that miracle. Manifest it in their lives, in their homes, in their families, in their jobs, in their situations, Lord. I pray, God, that your power would come down and would start to transform and change the storm into a season of peace. I thank you for this, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you are bigger and greater than any storm that may be raging in our lives. You're bigger and you're greater than any storm that may be trying to rise up and destroy and affect us in a huge way. Father, right now, I thank you, Lord, that you are bigger and that you have a plan and a purpose. I thank you, Lord, that your intentions toward us are for good and not for evil. And that we have a future. We have a hope in you. We trust you today, Lord. We reach out to you and say, Jesus, move in my life. I'm desperate for you. I'm desperate for your presence. Pour out your spirit, God. Pour it out on every household. Jesus. Maybe you're here and you've never even asked Jesus Christ into your life. Maybe you've never said, Jesus, I, I, I need you to be my Lord and Savior. You know, God, God shows us the ways that, that are, are the correct ways. And he, he tells us that if we're 
if we long for him, that he'll meet us right where we're at. When you recognize that the storms of life are overwhelming you and you need answers, Jesus is the answer. Maybe you've never asked that answer to be a part of your life. And if you're here today or you're watching us online and you've never said, Jesus, I need you to come into my life. I need you to, to change the situations. I need your help. I want to give you that opportunity today. I want you to say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. Maybe you've never prayed that prayer. You know, the word tells us that we're all sinners, that we're all lost, but we need a Savior. And God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior. If you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord, I'm going to give you that opportunity right now. Say, Lord, I need you. I need you in my heart. I need you in my life. We're going to pray. And I'm going to pray a prayer, and I want you to, to pray along with me. If you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord, I want you to pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I know that I'm a sinner, and I know that I need a Savior. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, be my Lord and be my Savior. I surrender to you. I thank you for dying on the cross for me and taking all my sins and crucifying them on that tree. I ask you, Lord, now, come into my heart. Be my Lord and be my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, there's a QR code that's going up on the screen and uh, online. You can, you can scan that, take your phone and scan it, and it will lead you to some information of what's next and how you can grow in Jesus and how you can have a faithful walk with Him. We've got some things that we'd love to get into your hands and love to be able to help you in your walk with God. Amen. Hallelujah.